Argument 7. Early Christian Believers Met on Sunday Another argument used to affirm the sacredness of Sunday is created from cherry-picking the writings of the early church fathers such as Barnabas, Justin Martyr, Diace, Ignatius, Dionysius, Clement of Alexander, and Terulian. This argument maintains that these writers affirm that early Christians met on Sunday for worship. This approach to the problem of Sunday sacredness is a smokescreen to hide the fact that the New Testament says nothing about Sunday becoming the holy day. Everyone knows that if certain historical facts are kept from sight, people can twist them to create a skewed view of history and make it whatever they want. However, when all of the historical facts are presented, they tell a very different story than what is often represented as history. During the first century AD, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire because of persecution. Christians were constantly on the move to escape capture, confiscation, punishment, and death. For a while, each Caesar seemed to be more intent on destroying Jews and Christians than his predecessor. Therefore, early Christians made theological compromises to survive. During the 2nd century AD, Judaism's influence over Christianity in Italy had faded because three or four generations of Roman-born Christians had come and gone. Jerusalem was a non-important heap of ruins, and Christians wanted their own religious identity, an identity that had nothing to do with the Jews. To make matters worse, many Gentiles had joined the church and brought their peculiar religious baggage. Consequently, Christianity in Rome mutated into a Romanesque version which was unlike Christianity in other parts of the world. By AD 150, 120 years after Christ ascended, Christians in Rome had found areas where compromise was possible with Mithraism. This led to theological ecumenism and apostasy. Many Christian denominations are participating in a similar process today and again, the result will be awful. When Rome destroyed Jerusalem, A.D. 70, Christianity was deprived of its headquarters and main office. Each church quickly found itself alone and became its own authority in matters of faith and doctrine. Early Christian history indicates that Christians adjusted beliefs and doctrines as needed, depending on the location and the leadership. During the last part of the 2nd century AD, Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyons, located in what is now called France, became alarmed with the heresies that had infiltrated the Christian movement. He was aware how Christians in Rome had begun to meet on Sunday and had abandoned the seventh-day Sabbath, and he spoke against it. He wrote, For he, Christ, did not make void, but fulfilled the, the law, the Ten Commandments. Irenaeus quoted again in the anti nicene Christian Library. Tertullian, another early church father, wrote extensively concerning Christian doctrine. He, like Irenaeus, was alarmed at the practices of certain Christians, especially those in Rome. In regard to the seventh-day Sabbath, he wrote, Thus Christ did not at all rescind the Sabbath. He kept the law, the Ten Commandments. He restored the Sabbath, the works for were proper to it. Terulian quoted in the anti nicene Christian Library. Debate over Sunday observance grew in those early years because the Church of Rome defended the practice. Bishop Archelius responded to Bishop Manus saying again, as to the assertion that the seventh-day Sabbath has been abolished, we deny that he, Christ, has abolished it plainly, for he himself was Lord of the Sabbath. By A.D. 320, confusion and compromise had devastated many early Christian beliefs. 
Christians in Alexandria, Egypt, were defending views on the deity of Christ that opposed the church in Rome. The Christian leaders discussed, debated, and argued the need for centralized church authority and leadership. Many agreed that church doctrine needed to be defined and protected so that heresy would not destroy Christianity, but they could not agree on a process or who would do the job best. Poor communication, distance, differences in culture, education, language, and social factors began to define Christianity according to geography. It was easy to see the result would be a highly fractured church. Both the world and Christianity needed a strong unifying leader, and Constantine concluded that he was the chosen one. He believed God had divinely appointed him to rescue a crumbling Roman Empire and the universal Christian church. When Constantine ascended to the throne as sole ruler of the empire about A.D. 312, he had transformed himself into a Christian for political advantage. Constantine was clever and saw Christianity as a means of unifying an ethnically and religiously diverse empire. When he endorsed the version of Christianity that was centered in Rome, he sent a sequence of events in motion that could not have been imagined. To put the empire on notice that Constantine had established a new world order, he had his army baptized into Christianity by marching them through a river. Then, to promote a universal day of worship, he implemented a Sunday law in March A.D. 321 as a political compromise. Constantine patronized everyone by declaring a weekly Holy Day holiday. His Sunday law meshed with the customary Roman practice and it was aligned with the desires of the Church of Rome. Even non-Christians were quite happy with a national day of rest. Let all judges and all city people and all tradesmen rest upon the venerable day of the sun. But let those dwelling in the country freely and with full liberty attend to the culture of their fields, since it frequently happens that no other day is so fit for the sowing of grain or the planting of vines. Hence the favorable time should not be allowed to pass, lest the provisions of heaven be lost. Did you notice that Constantine's decree did not mandate worship on Sunday? Though Christians in Rome had been meeting on Sunday for more than a century when Constantine announced his decree, other Christians around the Mediterranean Sea were not overjoyed. Most of the Christians outside Rome were still observing the Seventh-day Sabbath. Socrates writes near the turn of the fourth century, such is the difference in the churches on the subject of fast. Nor is there less variation in regard to religious assemblies. For although most all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Rome and Alexandria have ceased to do this. Constantine's decree did not abolish the importance of the Seventh-day Sabbath, Something else would have to occur before that could be accomplished. The leaders from the church in Rome needed a doctrine that dealt directly with the Lord's Day to present a strong case before the contentious and divided body of Christians. Eusebius, another apologist, peacemaker of the error, was a Christian confidant and advisor to Constantine. He masterminded a doctrine for Sunday observance that remains intact for Catholics today. Carefully notice his anti-Semitic argument for the observance of Sunday. Therefore, as they, the Jews, rejected it, the Sabbath law, the word Christ by the new covenant translated and transferred the feast of the Sabbath to the morning light and gave us the symbol of true rest. In other words, the saving Lord's day, the first day of light, in which the Savior of the world, after all his labors among men, 
obtained the victory over death, and passed the portals of heaven, having achieved a work superior to the six days' creation. On this day, which is the first day of light and the true sun, we assemble after an interval of six days and celebrate holy and spiritual Sabbaths, even all nations redeemed by him throughout the world, and do these things according to the spiritual law, which were decreed for the priests to do on the Sabbath. And all things whatsoever that it is the duty for you to do on Sabbath, these we have transferred to the Lord's Day, and more appropriately belong to it, because it has precedence and is first in rank and more honorable than the Jewish Sabbath. All things whatsoever that it was the duty to do on Sabbath, these we have transferred to the Lord's Day. Did you notice the last two sentences in Eusebius' argument? Eusebius testifies that we, Constantine and the leaders of the church, have transferred all things whatsoever that it was the duty to do on Sabbath to Sunday. Eusebius offered no scriptural authority for this change because there is none. Additionally, no church father or council from the time period challenged or affirmed Eusebius' claims. As it turned out, Eusebius took the thorny problem of worship in hand and became the father of a heresy that favored the apostate practices of the church in Rome. When a mere mortal, no matter how well-intentioned, declares by his own authority that the law of an eternal, almighty God is null and void, he is both delusional and evil. Centuries later, the writings of Eusebius created a huge problem for Protestants. Catholics do not question the sacredness of Sunday because they believe the Church has the authority to change God's laws. They believe Jesus gave this authority to Peter and his successors, Matthew 16, 19. On the other hand, Protestants have had to scramble for answers because they insist their faith and doctrine is based solely on the Word of God, but there is no biblical support for their Sunday-keeping arguments. Even though their reasoning is different, Catholics and Protestants abolished the Sabbath and substituted Sunday in its place. Who has higher authority, the Creator or the Created? One man says, Every day is holy. I worship God every day of the week. Another man says, It does not matter which day we worship on as long as we worship God. Such comments show no regard for the Creator's authority. If Jesus were on earth today, he would say of most Christians the same things he said to the Jews. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Matthew 15:9. Argument 7 does not support the sacredness of Sunday. It does explain how apostasy overtook Christianity. So in summary, we have examined seven common arguments used to rationalize the sacredness of Sunday. None of these arguments are valid. When it comes to embracing the fourth commandment, Christians generally face three obstacles. 1. Christian culture Ever since the 2nd century A.D., Christians in Rome have been advocating Sunday worship. Today, nearly 2 billion Catholics and Protestants worship on Sunday, regarding Sunday to be the Lord's Day, when there is no support for it in the Scripture. Therefore, going against the mainstream Christian culture and the opinions of experts who hold advanced degrees from seminaries it is difficult for an ordinary person. Those who insist on keeping the seventh day holy are often regarded as contemptible legalists who know nothing about the Bible or God's grace. Number two, lack of knowledge. Because Catholics and a majority of Protestants worship on Sunday, very few Christians have had any reason to question or examine the root cause of Sunday worship. 
Moreover, many people worshiping on Sunday do not regard Sunday as a sacred day. For them, Sunday is a day for common assembly, that is, going to church. Other than that, Sunday is a day for recreation, working or doing whatever a person wants or needs to do. This disconnect from the sacredness of the Seventh-day Sabbath has created the following justification. The Fourth Commandment does not really matter as long as we worship God and maintain a close relationship with Him. I think most Christians agree that one can worship the Lord every day of the week, but the requirement stated in the Fourth Commandment is altogether another matter. The Fourth Commandment demands that we cease from our labors and rest on the Seventh-day Sabbath that begins Friday at sundown and ends at sundown on Sabbath, Leviticus 23.32. The Lord commands that those who are within our gates, such as employees, servants, or anyone under our control, must also rest. The Fourth Commandment does not produce a weekly holiday. It produces a holy day, a day unlike the other six. The Sabbath is for spending time with God, with fellow believers, Leviticus 23.3, and for hearing the word of God. God's Sabbath is a day for denying the selfish desires of the sinful nature, Isaiah 58.13 and 14. Most of us who observe the seventh day as holy day find it awkward and difficult at times to deal with the ways of the world even when living within a Christian culture and heritage. Those of us living in the United States have enjoyed religious freedom for a long time, and it is sobering to think that persecution is coming when the seven-headed beast appears. If we add the pressures of social stigma and hostile consequences that can come from being a Sabbath keeper, some Christians think that it is best to just leave the Sabbath issue alone. It is easier to go along and get along than to lose a job, a spouse, and perhaps become a social outcast within your own family. However, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. John 14, 23 and 24. 3. Sinful Nature The biggest hurdle for all mankind regarding God's seventh-day Sabbath is our sinful nature. We are naturally opposed to doing whatever God commands. Paul wrote, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so, Romans 8, 5 through 7. When these three obstacles are combined, they are formidable. But we can overcome the world through faith because Jesus overcame the world, John 16, 33. He will give every sinner the strength to do what is right if we ask for it. This is where salvific faith comes into focus. Faith in God is required for everyone who desires salvation. If you feel impressed by the Holy Spirit to embrace and enter into God's Sabbath rest, pray about it and ask Jesus for the wisdom, strength, and courage to proceed. He rewards those who live by faith, Hebrews 11:6. Jesus said, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me, 
by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. John 16, 13, and 14. This study concludes with the inspiring words of Oswald Chambers. The moral law does not consider our weakness as human beings. In fact, it does not take into account our heredity or infirmities. It simply demands that we be absolutely moral. The moral law never changes, either for the highest of society or for the weakest in the world. It is enduring and eternally the same. The moral law ordained by God does not make itself weak to the weak by excusing our shortcomings. It remains absolute for all time and eternity. If we are not aware of this, it is because we are less than alive. Once we do realize it, our life immediately becomes a fatal tragedy. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Romans 7, 9. The moment we realize this, the Spirit of God convicts us of sin. Until a person gets there and sees that there is no hope, the cross of Christ remains absurd to him. Conviction of sin always brings a fearful, confining sense of the law. It makes a person hopeless, sold under sin. Romans 7, 14 I, a guilty sinner, can never work to get right with God. It is impossible. There is only one way by which I can get right with God, and that way is through the death of Jesus Christ. I must get rid of the underlying idea that I can ever be right with God because of my obedience. Who of us could ever obey God to absolute perfection? We only begin to realize the power of the moral law once we see that it comes with a condition and a promise. But God never coerces us. Sometimes we wish that He would make us be obedient, and at other times we wish He would leave us alone. Whenever God's will is in complete control, He removes all pressure. And when we deliberately choose to obey Him, He will reach to the remotest star and to the ends of the earth to assist us, quoted from My Utmost for His Highest, The Law and the Gospel by Oswald Chambers. 